for this particular workshop, we're going to do a little bit of introduction to Swarm to kind of get everyone familiar with what it is. I'm sure you've heard about it already. It's probably why you're in the workshop. But if you haven't gotten a full idea as to what it is, what it can do, what it's capable of doing, I'm going to quickly cover that. Um, uh, before I even get started, even then, we want to mention that um, all of the workshops will be providing AIA credit. Um, so for those of you for those of you looking for AIA credit, uh, just make sure to you know mention that as we have been gotten validation for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm and we will be sending a survey out as well regarding to that. So just you know, quick note, because I know some, for some people this is really, really important, especially if you're trying to get a licensing or, or keep your license, license in and all that. Um, it's a good thing, keep it in mind, ASA, AIA, -A -A, my bad. Um, so to talk about the workshop more or less, we're gonna do the introduction to Swarm and talk about kind of the main things with the objectives. And then once we've gotten past that, we'll be talking about the Swarm Web App, kind of introducing it, what it is in the online marketplace. Then we'll talk about the part that I'm pretty sure everyone has on their mind, which is setting up Swarm on your system and making sure it's running without errors. Lastly, once that's, that's going, we can talk about authorship and creating apps and installing and running apps from the marketplace or you know, locally from your computer. And then we'll have a little bit of like a say working session where we're gonna have everyone either create their own apps or use one of the example files I've provided in Slack um, and try to convert those into Swarm apps. And then lastly, questions and concerns and comments and answers that we can talk about at the end, um, as well as future potentials for Swarm. Now, um, Swarm in a nutshell, how do I put this, is a yeah, parametric tool for multiple environments. Ideally, Swarm is something that can harness the power of sort of computational parametrics and all those sort of crazy things you see people doing Grasshopper, just as an example, and bring it to other applications. Um, think bringing it to Rhino, bringing it to the web, and then having it be easily shared, bringing it to other applications such as Reddit. Imagine if you do a Swarm a Grasshopper app that does something really useful and you'd like to use that in Reddit, for example. Well, that's kind of the point. Um, Illustrator and then also engineering focused applications such as SAP and ETABs, all part of the CSI packages. Um, now the way Swarm works is it's kind of uh, primarily built in through Rhino, but then it has a huge marketplace that is kind of focused on uploading. You know, uploading all sorts of different apps that people can then use for different purposes and share them back and forth. It's, it's an app store, think of it like that. It's an app store that one can take and download an app and then share it or um, even edit it. If it's an open source app, you can go ahead and edit the app and change Changes to like um, depends on the authors author set it up. Um, now that's that's kind of a nutshell explanation of Swarm. primary. A tool for Swarm to create these Swarm apps that can be you learn how to create. So once you have a Swarm app and running, then you know we can actually talk about cross-platform, right? So, so if you make a Swarm app right now using Revit and vice versa, and then lastly, um, you should have an idea of how to use a Grasshopper canvas and how to use a Grasshopper toolset to create custom Swarm apps for different things, or even edit existing Swarm apps. Um, now, before we get started to the first first topic, does anyone have any questions in particular right now? Feel free to send them on Slack or speak up if you can. Um, yes, no, maybe so. I'll give you a couple minutes. Otherwise, we will proceed. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I wasn't sure if I was unmuted. I uh, just wanted to quickly ask are we going to go over one of the workflows of like a Swarm or a Rhino or Grasshopper to Revit type thing? In this workshop, well, okay. in this workshop, it's currently focused on just authorship and the creation of Swarm apps. Uh, it won't be touching until like we even make it. We can teach, uh, we'll go over how to make an app and then enable it for different applications, but we won't go over as to like go into Revit and then launch it from Revit. Uh, at least not demoing. We'll talk about it. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Anyone else? Okay. Well. So part one, what is Swarm? Um, 
like I said, Swarm is kind of a clouds-based computational powerhouse where you can use Grasshopper-based applications and use them different, um, different other softwares like Rhino, Illustrator, and Revit, this particular example. Kind of the discussion of how Swarm came about really became the idea of like, you have many different kind of practices and people who want to be able to use the power of computational tools um, within their softwares or just in general within their workflows. Sometimes, yes, we all have, we might have a computational team in the building or in house, or you can ask a consulting agency, or you might pick up some computational skills yourself. Either one is fine, any other one is fine. But um, what if you kind of had the ability to just quickly harness that entire tool set without having to get a really expensive computer that can run extremely complicated scripts or having to consult with someone or Needless to say, having to rely on computational specialists. Um, what if you could really just access something that's already primarily available? In other words, like an app that you can just download and play. So that kind of conversation led to the idea of Swarm being this cloud-based software, primarily through Grasshopper, that can be plugged into different applications. Um, right now, we're supporting, like I said, eTabs and um, SAP, Revit. We're working on an Illustrator one currently. Uh, and then the other ones, like, the ones I have on the screen are to come in the future, but primary developments are um, Illustrator, Revit, Rhino, and some of the engineering platforms. Um, any questions about that? Yes. No. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this uh, infamous uh, online marketplace. So Swarm itself, swarm.thorntomsayer.com is the main website where you will go and you will log in, you will download all things you need, but also you'll be able to access the marketplace itself or the app store, call it, where we will have all of these sort of uh, built-in apps. I mean, if they're public, they'll be easily accessible. And of course, you can make some of them private. You can make them accessible to your company exclusively. Those are all things that can be figured out later on. But in this particular scenario, um, this is kind of a preview of the app marketplace. You have all the apps that you can think of, and then eventually you just keep adding to it um, as, so as it keeps going. Um, for and also, additionally, if you have an app and you want to try it out, but you're not, you don't want to necessarily download it yet and try it out on Rhino or Revit or whatever, um, you have the ability to try it out on, on the web. In fact, all most, or actually say most um, Swarm apps and Swarm scripts that are developed can be previewed on the web and can be evaluated, checked out, and just kind of like shared. If anything, it can be also a good purpose for clients. Like let's say you develop a parametric model and you want to show the different possibilities of something. Um, you can do that by using the web app. And yes, it does work on your phone. So you should definitely try that if you haven't. But fortunately, that's kind of like the idea, right? It's a cloud-based solver, so you can preview all this stuff online, on the fly. And then, of course, go into Rhino, for example, and debug it, enhance it, customize it, and so forth. Um, like I mentioned before, it does exist in multiple platforms. And this is kind of what the dashboard looks like once you install the Swarm plugin successfully. In Rhino, it's on the right-hand side. We have the eTabs one on the sort of middle and SAP in the middle. And then on the left-hand side, we have Reddit. Um, now, like I, like, well, look, according to the question I heard earlier, we won't be going over running a swarm up in Revit, but this is kind of what I want to touch on, and we can also answer more of these questions later on towards the end. But yes, you will have the ability to run many different swarm apps in Revit and other applications. Just keep in mind that you still have to author them and create them in Rhino and Grasshopper. Once they're created, then you can go ahead and like try them out in Revit. Um, just one thing to note though, if you are trying them out in sort of an AEC focused applications, such as Revit and SAP and eTabs, you might want to build them with sort of a little bit more sensibility as to like, you know, the building mindset, not just create uh, abstract cool apps. Just a thought. Okay, so now um, this is the part where I wanted to get to. I'm assuming some of you have already attempted some of this. Um, but if not, we will have to go through it now. And as well as please tell Hanshan. Like I've noticed some people in the channel have already spoken to Hanshan about this. Um, so if you guys haven't already downloaded the MSI using the standard install, which is automatically installed into your platform, into your device, please do so and run that, as well as your core SSO. Make sure you have that set up. If you haven't gotten that set up, we will have to do the manual installation using the other two, the other two SIPs. Um, won't be very complicated. 
Um, the email I sent describes that also Hashem can gladly walk through that. And what else? Um, and also the two file paths I provide on here are basically telling you like where you should place that data. Now, before I move on, um, have you guys successfully installed Swarm? Because otherwise, I, the, the little live demo installer part would be a little bit difficult to go over. Feel free to let me know by uh, the Slack, or you can just go ahead and announce it. The little gift you see on the screen provides an idea of how to do the standard installation, which should be pretty straightforward. But like I said, if you haven't gotten a chance to do this, do it now, and please let me know, because we do want this to be an interactive workshop, so we will have to have someone installed in order to do the next following steps, as well as play the definitions I provided um, in this Slack channel. So if everyone is good with Swarm, we can proceed forward. Also, if you Swarm, if you downloaded Swarm yesterday, can you please let us know now? Because we there was an update that just went out today, um, and it would be great to update that. So that way we avoid any potential little bugs or any issues later on. So I'm not really seeing any responses for anyone, but I'm assuming that given the circumstances, you got Swarm up and running, yes or no? I got a quick question. Does yep. Swarm work with uh, Rhino 7? It does work with Rhino 7, yes. OK, thanks. Yes. No problem. Testing parameter. Rhino unknown. Is that uh, LNG? Who is uh, who is under who is LNG? Actions. Yeah. Okay. When I was a little plug in. Okay. okay. So. Sorry, so before I proceed forward, um, let me know if you guys have Swarm installed. I, I just okay. Well, all right. Now, assuming you have Swarm installed or not, you should be able to at least play with the um, Swarm apps on Rhino on the web app. In this case, if you haven't done so already, you'll feel free to go to the Swarm Marketplace. In this case, pick a, pick a web app of your choice. Um, and feel free to preview it. If you haven't um, already done that, I highly encourage it. And then lastly, to install, you would have to just bring up the web app and then go ahead and click on Install on the right-hand side as it shows it here. Once you've installed it, you'll see it pop up on your Rhino screen. And then you'll be able to just run it, edit it, play with it, and do any sort of uh, manipulations you'd like with it. An example of that. An example of that would also look something like this if we go to the marketplace. Go ahead and log in. Once you've logged in, you'll be greeted with uh, all the apps that you want to be able to look at. Um, any particular app that gets your interest, you can go ahead and click on it and install it by just literally selecting a given app. In this case, I've already uninstalled this app. I mean, I already installed it, so I'm getting the uninstall option. If you haven't installed an app, you'll get the install option. And if you want to preview it, you can click. You can simply just hit play over here. You'll go ahead and be greeted with the um, 
the three-dimensional web preview of the app. And you can go ahead and change the sizes and dimensions of it. In this particular case, the infinity cube. And you'll see your update on the spot. So if you ever want to go back to the main screen, you can quickly just hit up on the left-hand side, Swarm Alpha, and it'll bring you back to the main page of the app marketplace. It will be created again with all the apps you can play with and change. Um, another one, for example, is AC Tech Camry, um, which is a, another AC Tech class workshop we held a while back. And let's say I want to preview it before I want to install it on my computer. I can go ahead and play. And and for, also another thing you can look at is when you create a custom web app from Swarm, the actual physical geometries themselves can be selected and manipulated. For example, these geometries have metadata. They have glazing area, glazing height, and glazing tilt. And then you can actually preview that data by coloring it like so. So if you click any given element, in this case the glazing panels, you can see their relationship in the glazing height. And then on the bottom left-hand side, it'll be greeted with a series of numbers telling us their overall height from here all the way to the top. And of course, they will carry that data with them. Now, when you bring some of this information down into Rhino, you install this app, um, they will also carry that data when you bake it out into Rhino, or in this case, let's say you will want to bake it out into Revit, it should contain that data in parameters. Um, and also, the good thing about the web app, it does give you the option to sort of focus on specific conditions. So if you say you only want to look at the floor plates of this particular building, just disable these things, and you look at only the floor plates. Here we go. And then if you want to sort of toggle it on a different condition, you go ahead and can toggle on like the edges, and toggle on the core of the building, and the glazing. Now keep in mind, this is all something you built in right now, and we're going to go over that in a bit. Um, also, the web app has options of different uh, conditions. You can do the 3D view, you can do the top view, and all the other views. Front, left, back, right. Making it very useful for sharing purposes and also sort of discussing things, especially, especially when you're dealing with parametric model of sorts. Um, now, let's see, let's zoom that. Now, that covers up the web app for most. Now, does anyone have any particular questions about the web app, how to interface with the web app, how to download and install a different um, app or of the sorts before we go on to actual creation of an app? Anything at all? All right. Okay, well, if there's no questions regarding the, the sort of just managing of apps in general, we can talk about the actual creation of an app using my own Grasshopper. So I'm gonna, we're gonna run through this GIF here. It's gonna be really fast, and then I'm actually gonna do a live demo as to how to create one. But essentially, in Swarm, once you've got the dashboard up and running, you basically hit the little plus sign that's on the middle of the screen right around the Swarm and layers, and then you'll be greeted with a sort of blank canvas. This is app name and app description. In the app name and app description, you kind of write whatever you want, obviously to name it. Now, once you have this set up, you're gonna want to launch Grasshopper. It even says it on the bottom. It says, please launch Grasshopper to use Swarm build it. Now, you don't necessarily need the Swarm Builder yet. You need to just create the definition itself. Once you've built the definition, you can start creating the final components, which are going to be attributes, if you so want to include them, and then the Swarm Builders, which is coming up on the screen right now. Now, I know it's going by really fast. Uh, that's kind of the intention of it, just kind of giving you a preview of how it's supposed to be. I will actually go ahead and build an app on the screen. I'll start with a very simple one to describe like, sort of the different conditions of it and different things you can do. You can go ahead and do that. Now. Okay. now, assuming everyone's got Swarm up and running and up and installed, you should be able to see this in your Rhino can and your Rhino screen, your Rhino report. You should see the Swarm tab next to all the series of different tabs you have. And you'll see the icons of Rhino, Google Web, and the Kyoto Apps Editor, as long as with, and as well as whatever apps you've already installed. If you've installed some apps, which you can definitely do, and I highly recommend. I also recommend installing apps and go ahead and play with them. Try to get them up and running in Rhino, which should be very, very first. Um, now, assuming you've got all this up and running, like I said, let's go talk about authorship. Now, 
Once you got this form dashboard up, you see the little plus sign that says go to the apps editor. You can go ahead and click that. And when you go to the go to apps editor, it's gonna save you app. You can create a brand new form app by clicking that and you can say test, or in this case, the app name. So let's call it AC test. And then description, you can write whatever, whatever you'd like to write. Hopefully you're following along. Um, once this is all set up, if you're not following along, please shout out. <laughs> or don't, shout out or submit on Slack because this is the part that's really crucial. Going over the authorship, like it's, once you get the authorship down, it's kind of endless. It's a grasshopper definition, right? So you can build onto it infinitely in a way. Um, but it's really simple. It's really simple to get the basic premise of what it is. Um, oops. Okay, so I got my name going, I got a description going. Cool, and I opened up my grasshopper canvas, so I can go ahead and uh, create something. Now, in terms of the reference files I provided, if you are on the Slack channel, um, in this case, you will want to reference either the first one that says, that says a simple app, or you want to reference simple app with reference. Sorry for using the word reference again. What I meant to say was you want to go to the one that says AC Tech Virtual Academy 2020, zero simple app, or you want to go to the following one, which is one simple app with reference. Now, this is already kind of pre built. I'm going to go ahead and build it again, but just giving you a show of like a preview of how simple you can be. You can just make a sphere, an app that makes a sphere and changes sizes. Um, we'll be covering, oh, we'll be covering as to like, the basic idea of attributes, how certain uh, geometries can contain metadata about themselves. In this case, these little uh, triangles in space have, are containing their area. And then we'll talk about the Swarm Builder itself, which is the component that pretty much wraps everything and sends it into Swarm. Um, so, well, let's get started. So here, oh, whoops. So for the sake of example, we're gonna keep this fairly simple. And we're just gonna go ahead and create a mesh sphere. Have a little sphere on the screen. And then we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and give it two parameters. Let's say something between three and twenty-five. And we're gonna duplicate that twice. And that's gonna be the divisions in the U direction and divisions in the V direction. As you can see on the left hand side, my grasshopper is changing the geometry as expected. And then we're also gonna add in something like uh, the radius, the size, we can control that as well. Now, this is automatically gonna give us a geometry, a mesh in this case, that we can use to then potentially upload. In short, you could basically turn this as it is into a swarm map to demonstrate. So let's say you, you want to just create a swarm map that creates a little sphere and then you can control a number of panels on it, kind of like so. Um, the very first steps you would do, if that was like the end of your swarm app, you literally would type in swarm builder, and it brings up this component, which has inputs and outputs, and it should say here, connected to swarm. Um, my apologies for displaying the little, the timer, which, and yeah, I'm not worried about that for now. But if it says connected to swarm, you're in the clear. That means you're actually referencing back the dashboard and you're able to build it. Now. To keep it fairly simple, anytime you want to create a geometry, and a geometry is going to be an output. In other words, it's going to be something that the swarm app outputs or creates. You want that to be connected to a parameter. In this case, when I say parameter, I mean any of the components here. This is a beer at parameter, and this is a mesh parameter, and we have a curve parameter, and so forth. Um, swarm needs this to understand what geometry is coming in and uh, being outputted back out. So make sure that at the end of your definition, no matter how complex it gets, you want to make sure that the very last is an output or a parameter, and then that will get put into that. Once it's connected, you'll see it's automatically highlighted and grouped, and it's going to say swarm out, a number, and mesh. And you're going to see it should pop up on your dashboard and on the left-hand side. In this case, if you write it on the left-hand side. Now, to create the inputs to be able to make your swarm map parametric, you can take your number sliders over here, and you can just plug them in one by one into the inputs, and you'll see them light up automatically. So I just plugged in one, and for to plug in the next one, hold the shift bar as you're dragging it over, you see a little tiny plus sign show up, and a little green arrow, and then you can go ahead and connect them, and you'll see it populate on the left-hand side. In this case, you've successfully created 
the schematic of a SOAR map. And, this, and then we just need to name it properly so we know what's what. So in this case, click on the components themselves that are connected to the Swarm Builder component, and then you can go ahead and rename it. In this case, we'll call it Mesh Sphere, and it should update automatically on your dashboard. Same thing on the left-hand side, we have Radius. We can go ahead and rename that. The reason why it doesn't pick up the name automatically is because it wants you to name it. It wants you to sort of be explicit about that process of that particular slider. Sometimes in Grasshopper, we have components loading in space. We have a lot of things that we build and we don't name it. This is Swarm kind of being explicit and saying, hey, let's be clear about this app, about the parameters and whatnot. Because um, when you share it, it'll make life easier for everyone. So let's say e divisions. And also, as you build it, you can feel free to edit it, and you'll see it update on the spot. Um, it's not frozen. That's kind of like the beauty of it. It's a live editing process, so you can clearly go ahead and go ahead. So you can say U divisions. In this case, we can say horizontal. You can call it that. For simplicity sakes, horizontal divisions. And then this one, we'll call it vertical. Now, if your grasshopper looks something like this, or you start to get fancy and like add a couple more stuff, that's fine. But uh, once this is all set out, everything's properly named, and you're kind of satisfied with everything you're looking at, you see the little tiny arrow, or paper airplane, if you call it, down here? That is what you're going to hit once you are done building your app and authoring it. Click it. It's going to say, would you like to create a default save state on your app based on current output inputs? What that means is it'll basically record all the parameters in the particular setting you have it, and that'll be a save state of parameters. You can build numerous save states. You can, let's say you build a, a very complex tower, and the tower has a many, many different ways it can be um, parametrically iterated, but you want a series of, let's say, one to five different states to automatically click through. That's a beauty of save states. In this case, you always have to pick a one to start from and call it the default, so that, so the app will run from those point from those given parameters at the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and call this this condition at 14, 8, and 10 my safe state, my standard state. Anytime I run the app, so I'm going to hit share. It's going to go upload. It's going to tell me app created successfully. Nice. And then we're going to have all these three buttons down here. It's going to say view online, go to app, and then create a new app. If you want to create a new app, well, you can go ahead and click the plus button. In this case, we're in this case, in this case, we're going to go ahead and click on View Online to see if our app uploaded and what it looks like. Now, this is what happens when you upload an app. You're greeted with sort of like an uh, editing platform where you can go view the parameters, the parameters you built, and the standard state they've been saved at, the safe states that I've mentioned. In this case, we only have one, but we can go ahead and this can be a very long list of different conditions. You can name those states as well as analytics of your app, depending on who used it, if there's been any errors with it, which is very good for debugging if your app sees errors or it just doesn't run. Um, of course, paid users and all that good stuff, which can come later on. Now, um, you'll see this little icon, which is on micro generated. You can replace this with pretty much anything you want. Um, and it will become the standard icon for that particular app. You can change this, change that, description, um, and you'll have a couple other options talking about like which who can use this app in the marketplace. It's, it's public or email domain only. This is good for companies who want to make sort of something available only internal within the company, for example. Um, and then if you're so inclined to get more meticulous about the app and make a sort of payment plan for it, you can go further into this. Now this part down here, which opting platforms does this app run in? By default, Rhino and browser are automatically clicked. You create it in Rhino, and then wants to be able to run the browser. Those are on by default. Now, if you create an app that you want to preview in Revit and CSI, those would have to be ticked once you've created the app. And then you can go ahead in Revit, or any CSI application, and run it. And lastly, if you want other people to download this app and alter it as the alter pleasing, on their own pleasings, you can go ahead and make it open source and allow people to download the definition and alter it. We will cover this in a second. Um, and before I, get, before I move forward, you can also add people individually down here. So let's say I want to add someone else to this particular list and, um, and just have them view the app, edit it, or have admin permissions to it. In this case, since I'm the author, I have all permissions. But if I add someone new to it, I have to select what kind of permissions they want. It's also good for sharing with clients. Like let's say you just want a client to look at it and you don't want them to particularly edit it or do anything like that. It's very useful in that case. 
Now, once uh, that covers that part, you can go ahead and press play. So view the app on the browser, and you'll be greeted with pretty much the same thing as Team Song right now, which is a good thing. You can go ahead and change parameters and get an idea of it. It gets bigger. We can get um, subdivided in this case. Um, we didn't input any particular area, any particular attributes. We'll cover that in a second um, to make it a little bit more interesting than that. Um, now that covers literally the basic, most simple way of authorship. Now, if if you can go ahead and let's say you want to get the you want to look at the areas. Let's say you want to explode. Actually, no, wait, hold on. Let me take that back. Um, let's let me go back a step. Let's go back to the dashboard. Of, of Rhino and everything. And then think about like, let's say you have an app that you built and you want to edit it, you want to update it. You don't want to make a whole brand new app, you just want to take the existing one and edit it. To do so, you purely go back to the apps page or you can go to the app itself. And then you can go ahead and click edit, be online or uninstall. In this case, let's say I want to edit it. Now, the thing about editing, editing an app is that you're automatically going to be asked if you want to load the app um, from the state you last did it, or you want to use an OpenDH document. Now, the good thing about this is like, if you want to use an OpenDH document, you can actually build an app from an existing definition you have in place, um, which we'll go through in a second. But in this case, let's just load the app from the server as it was, and it will bring us exactly the definition that we were working on and building. Um, now, one thing I, want, I do want to say that I'm sure people are wondering about when you're building this thing is like when you build a definition, does it disappear? And does it go away? No, it does not disappear. It doesn't go away into the abyss or anything of the sort. It's still um, in your system. It's just going to have a really funky name, as you see on the top right of my screen. But I do recommend if you're meticulous and nervous about like creating content, save a version before you upload it, and you can just kind of have it there and have that be the sort of pre-sworn version. You don't want to kind of keep this in your in your local definitions. This is only kind of intended to work with the Swarm platform when you're uploading and creating apps. Now, if you ever lose a definition, um, it's going to be on the server. So go ahead and you can go back to the web app, download the app, install it, and you can have that download definition again, just like we did just now, and be able to update it. Now, in this case, let's go ahead and give this thing some attributes, which we can then talk about later on more so. so Let's explode them into panels. So let's explode. So by doing this, I can get back individual panels, individual meshes in this case. Just gonna take this. And I'll preview the preview. Okay. Sorry, hold on, I gotta refresh that again. There's a, a preview issue that just happened, but essentially, you go to AC test, you can edit the app, you can load the app, and then we'll reset back. Now, okay, the reason why you're seeing this preview is this preview is from the dashboard itself, it's not from the Grasshopper preview over here. The Grasshopper preview is different, this internal has over there. Now, if you wanna disable a preview on this particular end, you can go ahead and on the bottom of the outputs down here, you can go ahead and disable wireframes and shade solids, and it will disable the preview, as you can see. You can go ahead and continue building your definition so that way it doesn't get sort of convoluted with two different previews at once. So, let's explode. In this case, we want the individual parts as panels, so then we can get the area of each individual one, bottom panel down there, and then use that as an attribute for a particular format. Now, to make it a little bit more interesting, if you guys downloaded Weaverbird and got that up and running, you'll be able to do a frames, which is going to create basically a frame around each panel. And then you'll be able to do the frame versus the individual panel itself. So this would look something like this. And this is going to look like the example app I gave you. And we can go ahead and give that a parameter or something new. So we can say one less than 40, for example. We can plug that into the distances so that way they match. And we can see the frame is going to react. 
and then we have the panels reacting immediately. Now, that once, also, once that's all set up, we're going to go ahead and do area. So we can start getting the areas out of each individual panel. So we can take a look at that. We have a bunch of areas here. It's very good. Now, once that's set up, we can, like I said, set that out to a parameter. So in this case, lender. And then you want to remember this thing as the area. So you can go ahead and make it out for yourself or the scribble that or a panel, whichever one. Either way, make a note. And then just say this is areas of panels. And then we can type in construct attributes. You should see this icon right here, construct attributes show up, and it's going to look something like this. Now, once an attribute showed up, it's going to ask for a series of different conditions like ID, name, layer, keys, values, and colors. For this particular example, we're going to be covering specifically uh, keys and values, layer and name. So in this case, we know that this particular area here, the window, is going to be called the panels. So we can have that belong to the layer panel. So that way when we upload into Swarm, those are going to be always under their specific layer, not just arbitrary geometry in space. The next one is keys. In this case, keys is the name of the, that of the attribute, the attribute we're looking for, so area. And then the last one is the values themselves, the values of the area. We can to plug this in. Now, if you're familiar with Grasshopper, if you're not, um, you'll notice that this list, it looks a little differently, or sorry, it looks a little different than sort of this list, or my bad. Um, yeah, then this list, which is like what we call a flat list. And then this on this, in this case, this is called a tree. Now all that means is that it's basically taking every single element in here and converting it into its own list. I won't go too far into, into that, but just keep in mind that whenever you're creating um, attributes for multiple geometries, make sure in this particular scenario, if it's, a, it's coming from a flat list, like so, to graft it. Because then that way the attribute will belong specifically to that specific geometry. And if that, if that was a little bit unclear, we can go over that um, some more. That's a little bit more grasshopper techie stuff. In this case, we're just kind of try, trying to cover swarm. Um, in this case, we have a series of windows, a series of numbers. We build some attributes. We can go ahead and Build that, and then once that's all set up, we're going to type in inject, inject swarm attributes. What inject swarm attributes does is it'll take your mesh, or in this case your geometry, and then it'll take the attributes you already built and combine them into one one specific uh, object. Now keep in mind that this looks, if you were to plug in a panel out here, it's going to look the same. It's going to look the same as this. I know it looks the same. But once it passes through its component, it's basically what we could call a hypergeometry or a geometry that has metadata embedded in it. Now Swarm will read that data and be able to use it to create, um, to say this particular panel here has an area of like one point something. Now once we have this set up, we can go ahead and, we can go ahead and copy it over to the other side. So let's, let's say we wanna get areas for all the elements involved, such as the frames. And so we get the areas of the frames, and then we go ahead and get to here. And then, okay, once that's all set up, you basically create attributes for two different conditions, for the frames and for the areas, and then you can go ahead and drag over your swarm builder, and you're gonna replace this particular output over here. As it was originally coming here, you can go ahead and replace it over here. So you're gonna ahead take this one, like so, and it's going to update on here, and then you're going to go ahead and do shift, and it's going to update within your dashboard. It should update automatically. And again, go ahead and name it so that way you know which one is which. So in this case, this one we know is the oops, mesh panels, and then we have mesh frames. Okay. Um, now, once that's all been set up properly and you see the preview running and operating as it should, you can go ahead and update your app. You can even add a new description on it and say updated. But once that's all set up, uh, the little 
circle that with a little time clock on it. That is what we call what you would call the updating function. In this case, we didn't create any. Oh, we did create a new parameter. I'm going my back to go through that. Um, go ahead and add the new parameter into the inputs, and you'll see it pop up as well. In this case, we'll call this the frame distance. The frame. Now we've added a new parameter, we've added attributes, and we've created geometry. We replaced all existing geometry. Now once that's done, we can go ahead and would you like to create a new default state state? In this case, let's say yes, because we're updating the app, but we're also updating it with new geometries and conditions, and we want to create a new state. So it always runs in a specific state whenever anyone opens it. So sure, it's going to go ahead, app updated successfully. And once it's ready, you can go ahead and view it on the store. And we'll see that it updated. We have frame distance, mesh frames, and mesh panels. And in this case, we can actually click on a geometry and visualize its metadata that we inputted those attributes. In this case, area. And we can color everything by those specific areas. And it'll also tell us what layer it belongs to. If we click on this geometry over here, it'll say those belong to mesh frames. And then we know this belongs to the mesh panels or the windows. So, um, now, also, one little function about the but the system is that now you have those two layers, so you can go ahead and toggle only the panels or toggle only the planes or the frames in this particular scenario. And you can change the color of it as well if you so like to. We have a couple of pre existing gradients to choose from. And then remember it's going to update the color, but also keep the information on the left hand side. Um, lastly, you can also toggle by attribute. We added both area and layer, so if we turn both of them on, we'll see that they get colored differently. And, it'll, and once we hover over something, it should immediately tell us like, what it is and what we're looking at. In this case, mesh panels, mesh frame, and so on. Um, yeah, and that covers the basic idea of creating a swarm app, updating it, and downloading it from the cloud, and editing, editing it. Okay, now before I proceed forward to the next portion, um, does anyone have any particular questions? Do the um, if you use an app like Elephant, for example, to create attributes? Yes. Could in theory you could you plug that in, or is it or is it just better? Are you just better off using the Swarm the Swarm app? I mean, it's the same thing, right? I, I presume. Uh, maybe not. It's it's let's put it this way: the way you construct those app attributes is similar. But the way that Elephant constructs those attributes won't be read by Swarm. Um, uh, that's what I'm saying. You, you're better okay. off. Yep. You need to use this. Because this is particular to the Swarm app, to the way it transfers over to different applications and all that. OK. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, of course. Um, OK, I want people feel free to ask questions or like text questions. I'm going to open up one more definition app. And I'm going to show you what it's like to sort of take an existing definition and just um, turn that into a small map. But while I do that, let me know if you have any particular questions about anything else. I had a quick question, yes. <clears throat> actually regards to like the, the business model, I guess. Like, can yeah. anybody just go in and make an app and then anybody can download and use it? Um, trying to think of like, you know, if, you know, I'm a part of our design technology group, if I create an app, could I just put it on Swarm and then our users could use it? Uh, try it, okay, I'm gonna say yes. Yes, if you, as long as you have a Swarm account, you can create an app and have that be accessible by either users you specify or publicly or within the domain. But yeah, I'm hey. not sure if I answered your question fully. Yeah, Jonathan, I can jump on that yeah. one, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, this is uh, David from Core. Uh, yeah, so um, your group, uh, if you use uh, email addresses that belong to your company or your institute um, or whatever organization you're with, um, you can actually privately share apps within that group that only people in that group will see. Um, so if everyone's using kind of a common domain, um, they'll be able to see those apps. Um, you can also privately share them uh, between individuals, uh, and then you can also keep them completely private to yourself as well uh, if you just want to test some apps. Um, you just have to go and click that public uh, function uh, in the, the uh, app on the uh, web page uh, to actually make it public. Before that, everything starts off being private, uh, and you can kind of choose how you want to expose it up from there. Okay. I think that covered it. Yeah, basically, I was just 
trying to understand if, if we need to pay for this as a service or not? Currently, no. <laughs> okay, Currently. so th there might be future um, ch uh, changes to that plan. Yes, yeah, there's, there's plans in the future to have essentially, mostly because, you know, we have to pay for the servers and make all this run. Um, there's going to be some kind of tiered services. There's always going to be kind of a free version uh, in our kind of uh, our uh, business plan for this uh, that's open and available. Um, but then there'll be kind of paid levels that might then enable some of that internal exposure or different types of sharing. So we're still working through that. Awesome. Thanks, David. Yep. Okay. Um, anything else? Any other questions? In general, actually. In general, um, I guess I'm curious about, I mean, how does this, how do you have to build an app if you want to be able to use it in Revit? Do you have to be mindful of, what do you have to be mindful of? Or what are some of the parameters you need to be taking into account? You have to be mindful as to, in this particular scenario, as to how Revit operates. Um, if you've ever gone deep into Revit, you know most of it's center line based, right? These are most, most of the geometries are typically lines in space that have some sort of profile as well that go sweep along them. Or sometimes you do get those exceptional sort of mesh or um, geometry, ob geometry objects that have no particular Revit characteristics or attributes. Um, in other words, they're not true Revit objects. Now, that said, yes, you do have to be mindful of the app you're building for. Um, for example, like Revit, or if you go towards um, CSI, like um, SAP or ETABS, all those things run off center line. So you're gonna have to be building things that are line based. And as you're building line based, you wanna add particular, particular attributes to them, such as profiles. Um, um, oh man, I'm, looking, I'm sorry. Profiles and other different parameters that are particular to the application. So, in short, yes, be mindful of the app you're building for, of the application you're building for. Okay, thanks. Yep. I have another question about similar to that, which is um, I understand that you can, you have the ability to run this app outside of, you know, the Grasshopper environment. And that gives some, mm -hmm. um, that's the idea of the app, I guess, is this web based application space that people can play around with parameters. Um, right. And is there, but I was understanding, maybe there's misunderstanding, there's portability between the Grasshopper application and a, let's say, Revit application. There are actually two different applications that you'd be building for to target two different platforms, or could you build a Grasshopper app that would run, you know, map it to Dynamo object or something and work in Revit? Okay. Um, hold on, map it to, the, let me pull up this one thing. Mm, the Dynamo question, uh, I thought, I wouldn't say look, I wouldn't say we're mapping to Dynamo objects. We're looking specifically at Revit, um, not interfacing interfacing with Dynamo. So that's that's a little bit beyond the particular scope here. But um, when you build an app, you have the luxury of building it so it's applicable to different applications, um, or you can sort of specify like this is only useful in SAP. This is only useful or not useful. Sorry, this is only operating in SAP. Only operating in Revit. Now, let me see an example. Uh, let's say if I take the custom steel bay, for example, or, um, or I want to say the, I have an example up that I want to show. For example. That Jonathan? Yep, go ahead. While, while you're looking for an example, um, uh, it's a good question. There's kind of two ways to map for it. One is you do have to do a little planning on the grasshopper side um, because the underlying kind of parametric model is always grasshopper. And you can map it to, uh, you know, center lines being targeted um, for beams or polylines for slabs. Um, but in the Revit app, you can also, or the, the Revit clients for Swarm, you can load up that um, app and then specify that you want the polylines to be a floor or you want the um, lines to be a beam. So you have the ability to kind of map that in there, but also preset it um, for what the user wants. So I'll say this, both the Revit and the Illustrator clients are very alpha at this point. Um, we haven't released them publicly as we're kind of finalizing some of exactly these decisions, but we are looking for um, people to kind of become the initial alpha users for it um, and to see kind of where the strong opinion on how you want to interface with it is. 
Um, so it's a good question because, for example, if you're using meshes or surfaces with the Illustrator client, it doesn't do anything. Um, but if you use curves and lines and you know all two-dimensional geometry, then you can get those results back and forth. And also jumping off of that, um, we are looking to expand more of these workshops. And we are specifically looking to have ones for like Swarm intro to Revit and Swarm intro to Illustrator. And so if anybody's interested in attending those, then we could also automatically put you on the alpha tester list. Um, and sort of a follow up on that, this workshop was primarily aimed at just authorship and be able to understand the basic schematics as to what Swarm is, how you can use it, how you can manipulate it, how you can create something that eventually you can customize and look for uh, putting into other applications once those Swarm plugins have been successfully rolled out. Um, now, ideally with the things you've learned from this workshop and the different kind of skill sets you've picked up, you should be comfortable being able to make an app, being able to construct an app, edit an app, download an app, and even um, take an existing definition and create an app from it. Um, that's kind of like the primary goal here. It's an introduction to Swarm. Now, like Shannon said, uh, future workshops are coming left and right. So if you're more interested in learning specifically or enhancing your skill set and knowledge on Swarm, come back and sign up. We'll be more than happy to show you more things. Now, uh, one thing I do want to ask is that, is there anything um, anything that was unclear or fuzzy or sort of left behind in regarding creation of an app or handling the interface or simply just uploading, downloading, and updating an application? And feel free to ask questions or comments. So I have another question. Hi. Yep. Uh, what happens with um, a grasshopper plugins when you use them in definitions, whether public or private ones? Great, when Are they in grasshopper plugins? Uh -huh. So uh -huh. if you use them in your definition and you create a one that runs in Swarm, but and then I'm another saying... person who doesn't have those plugins oh, okay, I understand. take the plugins. definition from Swarm and are they kind of embedded and run on the server or do you need them to be installed? They're embedded and run on the server. We have a server with a, yeah, a handful of definite, oh, sorry, a handful of plugins already installed. And we're currently looking to expand that list of plugins. Um, cool. You know, as time goes on. Yeah, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No worries. Um, and kind of going off of that question, everything on the Swarm is, again, cloud-based, so it's kind of internal, and it's external from your computers, right? So if you build something, and as long as a particular plugin you use is supported, um, it will work on the app, it will work on the web app, and the only time you'll see a sort of conflict is when the user decides to download the script and do an edit locally, kind of like, let's say I took one of these existing apps, um, uh, let's say like the Mesh and Play one, take one of the existing apps and I want to edit it. If I didn't have any of the particular plugins that this um, app uses, then I won't be able to load it up on my Grasshopper and edit it because as, as I'm sure you guys have tried downloading things and you're missing something, you're gonna get the window that says, do you have this plugin installed or et cetera. But as long as you run the setup within the app dashboard, um, you, will, you won't have any problem or any user won't have any problem because again, it will be referencing the server, it will be referencing the cloud not your local. Um, any other particular questions or anything else? Uh, well, if there's nothing, um, there's nothing else particular. You're more than welcome to take the example files I provided in the Slack channel and try to convert them to this format. Ideally now, because then we can debug it on the spot and see, like, answer your questions as you're doing it. But um, take one of those and with some kind of little things you saw here, 
try to create a swarm out of it, upload it to the interface, to upload it to the web, and then try to see if you can run it on your local, try to see if you can share it with someone and have them edit the parameters and whatnot. Another thing you can do is that the example plugin provided, some of them are just very simple. Um, ooh, plugins, plugin question. The plugin list. There's an extensive plugin list that's currently being edited. And I believe uh, Han Chen would be more suited for answering that particular question. And he's, he's actively working on that. Yeah, uh, later, later today we can send out a list of what kind of uh, plugin we're supporting. And then if you always want more, um, uh, want us to support more uh, plugins, feel free to send us an email with a request. And then uh, if it's your plugin, then it's really easy to put it on our server. But then if it's, let's say, um, some public um, plugins, then we have to send an email to the author and see if we can and request for his uh, consent because like um there are legal issues there um yeah well let me go back to the slide for a second but that is in summary a very introductory uh, introductory workshop to swarm and basically how to use it how to Develop things from it. Like I said, please use uh, please use the provided example files, and we'll try to develop your own. We want to see the Swarm app marketplace populate with more things. Um, we want to see that marketplace just literally infinitely populate with anything and everything, so we can see it, people being using it. And as people use it, it'll help us develop and sort of flesh out any any kinks or anything like that. Um, otherwise, uh, keep us posted and. Let us know what you think about it. Let us know what other kind of things you'd like to see from it. Um, and definitely let us know if it's helping your workflow. Because it's something that we, that's kind of the intent. We want to incorporate this into whatever workflow you're looking at. Hey, John, do you want to go over a little bit about saving, like using safe states both in the local Rhino client and on the website? We can probably also show like downloading Rhino files on the web app as well. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so let's make multiple safe states with the download web app with an existing app. So okay. So let's say like this. So let's say you have an existing definition here and so let's say you have an existing definition here and you want to be able to edit it and have different uh, safe states from it. So let's say for a particular example, you have one that has many, many, many subdivisions and very few horizontal subdivisions. Okay, let me go a little more obvious. Something like that. Now, you can go ahead and click on the bottom right hand side of the app you're working on. You're going to be presented with what's called save and load. You can go ahead and save this as a state and call it um, so save state, save state one with um, H4 and what was it? Let's just call it save state one. Um, okay. Then you can go ahead and save that. Now, you can make as many as you want in this case. Um, it's not pretty much safe to that. You can go ahead and quickly run through everything and start creating different versions of it. And as you're creating different versions, you can go ahead and click the three bars on the right hand side, save a new state. And there we go. Once you've successfully created a different save state, it'll give you a notification that says current save state, uh, current state saved, apologies. And once that's been uh, established and done, you can go ahead and view this on the web app, for example. Just kind of get an idea of those save states and see where they are by going to save states. And you'll see the different conditions. You'll see the ones that were initially created when we were building the app, and then the ones we just created now, which is save state one, save state two. You can quickly toggle between them and then you can make one a default if in case you want that to be the standard one that happens every time you use it or otherwise you can just leave the standard one that you had 
Um, whenever you run the app on the browser, you have the option to load any of those particular states by just launching the app, clicking on the three dots, and going to save states and saying, I want to be able to run this particular state versus that one. So let's see, we run save state two. We go ahead and click on it and click the little download button. And then, yeah, there you go. It just updated. So, and then the reason why I updated back is I hit the play button. But let me demonstrate that one more time. Save states, load, pick a state, we download, and then you wait a second, and then it'll update. And like it still carries on all the things we developed with it, all the, all the attributes and whatnot. Um, and then the other thing about the Rhino is that you can go ahead and take a 3DM snapshot. In other words, download a 3DM version of this site file. You'll see that you're going to pop up on the left-hand side. It's a Swarm 3D. And then we can go ahead and open that. So this is very useful when you're sharing things with different people and you want them to be able to quickly download something from your particular app um, instead of having them just like play with it endlessly. So in this case, we, we see what we see here is we see the downloaded version of the web app that we just did. And we'll notice that it has a series of frames along with the individual panels themselves. Now, if there's one thing you're familiar with in terms of Rhino, there's uh, properties attributed to any given geometry, which is the things we're building at before. Um, and then you'll notice, in this case, what we call user text, attribute user text. And you'll see here, um, actually, this is not working. Well, in the, in the, in the web app, the attribute user text stays internalized whenever you download it to your from Swarm, you'll be able to see this. But when you're creating a 3D snapshot, it just internalizes the geometry, not the attributes, because it's meant for just kind of being able to quickly edit the geometry and write it up. Um, is there any questions or anything particular about that? Dealing with safe states, dealing with different conditions and different iterations, how you can generate different iterations and download it into Rhino for different sharing purposes and whatnot. Any questions, comments about that? Okay. Um, Han is there uh, any particular comments you'd like to talk about Swarm since you're on the dev end of it? Um, not in particular, but I'm wondering if anybody who has attended this workshop would be interested in seeing how Swarm can be used inside your own internal organization, like showing how you can create an app for your own company instead of like just dumping it to the public marketplace or something like that. If you're interested, feel free to give a shout out, again, through email or Slack or any of the above. Okay. We can, uh, we can definitely look into preparing something like that. So uh, I, think, uh, I think somebody said they'll be interested in seeing. Yes. Yeah. I see that. And my friend, uh, yes. um, we can we can have some we can set that up. Please come back to the future workshops for that. We can have something set up that way so you can go ahead and specify different uh, domains and conditions. Unless it's able to do it now, so. I think maybe we can just show that how you can change the settings right now so they show up under your own. So for now we can just show it showing up under our TT tab. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and uh, guide, you can guide this through, I'm sorry, if you'd like. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Maybe you can just go to any of the apps that you created and then go to settings and change it from maybe like something from public to a private domain app and then see it showing up somewhere else. So we can take off the public, which now makes it a private app. In this case, no one has access to it unless I give them access, like the people listed down here. And then we can make it email domain only. In this case, only people with the specific email domain, like Hanshan was describing, will have access to this app. Um, in this case, I could say only TT, people with TT emails can now use this app um, versus just anyone who goes into the marketplace.
Yeah, and now if you go go to the public marketplace and then go to your own company tab, then you should be able to see it over there. And then uh, as a developer, um, every time you go and update your own app, uh, it's going to go go ahead and update for every single one who has installed your app. So the next time when they go open Swarm and try to run your app, they don't have to go somewhere else to download and download the new version or install specific plugins that's that's needed for that grasshopper script. Uh, all they need to do is go to Swarm, click on the app, and then start using it right away. That's it. Um, okay. Um, is there a way to host your own uh, plugins or, or components and connect it to this, or is it only through the Swarm app? Currently, actually, currently it's only through the Swarm app. Um, you can build a custom component, like let's say you built something through C Sharp or through Python. Those are supported. Um, but I'm, I'm sure you're talking literally have a custom plugin that's not part of the server, right? Yeah, or I mean, like instead of uh, waiting to see if you guys get approval uh, from the the plugin creator, mm -hmm. if we had our own internal server location where all our you know user objects or you know libraries are kept, uh, is there any way to port to that? Actually, uh, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> Hi, this is Sergey from Core. Um, so. There, there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, one, it's a couple of plugins that you're interested in. Always, you know, feel free to reach out and uh, talk to us. We will be able to edit. Um, if it's more of a question, like we have a bunch of internal plugins, don't really want to share with anybody. It's kind of for internal use. Um, there's something that's in the works. We're not currently offering this as a product, but it's something that we've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, is being able to run Swarm on premises. So for instance, if your organization just wants to use it internally uh, to share you know, between all of the, um, all of the designers uh, within the same firm, um, there might be options in the future where you'll just be running your own server, your own um, compute service and kind of keep everything internal to your own metal. Um, and in that case, you have full control over what plugins are being run. OK, thanks. So on the, on the server side, is this using like McNeil's? Do they have like a server client or something that's, or a server client server set up? Or are you guys, I mean, is it? Uh, how are you generating the representations on your on the on the server side? So this is using uh, Rhino inside. Um, so basically, it's something that's uh, to a degree inspired by Rhino compute. We're not using Rhino compute, uh, but we have our own servers uh, that run on EC2 um, that are able to load a headless instance of Rhino um, inside of them. So this way we can send requests to the servers, we can do all the operations that, um, you know, a regular UI version of Rhino is able to do and then spit back the result. Got it, that's great. So if you had a, Re a Revit, I was thinking if you had a Revit version, you might not be able to do that, right? Well, so with the Revit, uh, it's more of an interop question. Like when you're using the Revit plugin, uh, you're not uh, you're not running Revit or Dynamo in the cloud. You're still running our Rhino servers with Grasshopper, which is how you can write um, you know Swarm apps compatible with multiple platforms. It's all Rhino. It's all Grasshopper in the background. The question is, how does the client interpret uh, that geometry that it gets back from the server? once it bakes it back into SAP or Revit or ETAPs or other applications that don't deal with geometry per se, but deal with more complex, higher level elements. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that we mentioned earlier that we have components that help you organize the proper attributes um, 
So you need to provide more information to that geometry for the client to be able to say, oh, I guess that's a beam and I have the center curve. So through Revit API, I can now make an actual beam object. Right. That makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay. so one more question. Since you standardize the inputs and outputs a bit, uh, maybe not standardized, but well, you have your own input output wrappers. What can you potentially like plug these marketplace apps together? I mean, um, so this is funny <laughs> because this is so something that we we spoke about uh, internally, and uh, it gets a little meta. Uh, because it's like, yeah, okay, so we can now create apps and then connect outputs of one app to another app. Um, there is definitely use case for that, uh, and it's kind of an interesting um, thought experiment to perform. Um, currently, this is not something that we um, directly pursue on the kind of desktop client side. But this, this is something you could potentially play with in our Grasshopper client. So this is something we didn't mention at all um, during this presentation. It's kind of slightly outside of the scope. But we do have in the same package that you know, uh, allows you to build Swarm applications, there's kind of another section, which is the Swarm Grasshopper client, which lets you pull down apps. And we have those components, which basically you plug in an app, and it generates inputs and outputs. Uh, appropriate that app. And this way you could actually string together multiple swarm apps inside a grasshopper definition, which is again kind of meta, but it does make sense because you're using compute resources of some other server cluster. You're not running things locally. Right. Um, so that's a very long way of saying yes, that's possible. Yeah, that's Very cool. Thank you. Anything else at all or in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> it feels like no, it's good. It's good. The questions are good, uh, especially right now as we have a lot of different people online who can answer many different questions. Um, but yeah, if there's anything else right now, please speak up or text it either way. Um, I was just interested to see how, uh, with you know, other platforms such as maybe Hypar, Giraffe, and how Swarm. It is similar or different or how all of these end up comparing to each other? Sure, I can take a quick stab at that and some of the comparisons. Uh, some, someone else had asked the question, uh, might even have been yourself, about uh, um, Shape Diver and uh, Compute as well. Um, right. So just kind of, I think where Swarm is trying to position itself is more in the kind of marketplace and app sharing. Um, the idea being here that if you have no grasshopper experience uh, whatsoever, um, you could have someone install Swarm for Rhino and basically use the tools or, you know, shortly uh, Swarm for Illustrator or um, uh, uh, Revit. And that's kind of been one of the, the initial focuses. It's a bit of a differentiator is the idea of the desktop clients. So while a lot of these other ones require you to go to the web and use the web app or pull information back into uh, Revit, um, or sorry, not Revit, uh, Grasshopper. Um, you can um, you can actually use this without ever really having to have anyone with a Grasshopper background. Um, what I would say is, um, if we look at Shape Diver, uh, Shape Diver uh, has a focus on kind of uh, web uh, configurators um, for products, so they have a much more robust um, uh, online visualization platform, uh, which gives you know for architects and designers. I think a, uh, a really nice kind of visual presentation and they additionally have a bit more of a tested and stable. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, and uh, yeah, sorry, I just had my kid turn down as a, as a video in the background. Um, so uh, Shape Diver, you know, also has a, a more, let's say, long-term vetted uh, compute platform. So ours is, you know, less than a year old uh, and still under heavy development. Um, whereas if you're looking for something that you need to put out there in the world as a consistent product, um, at this point, Shape Diver is a more stable platform for that. 
Um, compute uh, is basically just the raw compute background, so it has no kind of front-end interface or distribution model. The big advantage is you can somewhat do whatever you want uh, on top of it, um, but you kind of have to build up that whole interface. Uh, and the last one, Hypar, I'd say the big um, thing about Hypar is Hypar has a pretty heavy commitment um, to use their language and their system um, to, uh, to actually get into authoring content for uh, the Hypar platform. The real goal is Swarm, uh, and it's something we're consistently working towards uh, and working with McNeil a little bit as well on trying to simplify this experiences. Our goal at the end of the day, um, when we eventually get there, is that basically you just take your grasshopper definition as it is, and you uh, push it up to Swarm. You don't have to do any big conversions or online uh, changes um, to, to the way it works. So we're not completely there yet. You know, there's still some, some steps that have to be taken. Um, but the real goal is essentially, if you make it in Grasshopper and you have plugins we use, uh, you can basically just upload it to the web. Awesome, thanks, David. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, one more question. Oh yeah, please, please, please. Keep going. <laughs> um, that is, uh, because it's a, a web web application at some level. Do you have any plans for? It's probably pre premature for an open API, but uh, you know, for for those of us who have other web based applications um, running, we'd like to tie these things together. Um, uh, you know, if, if you have a standardized web API, we could bring this sort of back into, uh, you, know, you know, think about connecting it to our backend apps and other apps. So is there, are there plans for a web API? The short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is the amount of time it's going to take to implement. <laughs> so uh, yes, it is in discussion how that's going to actually come into play. Um, it's, I, uh, to be blunt, it's probably pretty far out um, still right now. Uh, and one of the other big questions for us is, you know, if we get into that territory where potentially other applications are hitting our compute servers at a higher rate, that's probably gonna have to be something um, that falls under some type of subscription package or something like that. So, um, you know, it, it is kind of on our radar as a direction to go in, um, but we're, we're still kind of thinking about how that's gonna be implemented. All right. And just to add to that point, um, in the meantime, we do have uh, experience in-house of trying to build applications on top of the Swarm backend. So as, as a technology, as a way of kind of quickly throwing together something that uses Rhino as a backend, you know, over the network, um, we tried it, we've done it, it works. It's just a matter of, you know, as Dave mentioned, kind of formalizing this and um, presenting this to the outside world in some shape or form. Right. Yeah, it'd be exciting. Um, your class, once again, anything else? Mm -hmm. Or anything, actually, better question, is there anything you'd like to see getting covered in the upcoming workshops, in the future workshops, um, aside from just the introduction to Swarm and how to create stuff? Um, is there an online tutorial that goes end to end? I didn't really check it out before this session. Or is there like a more self-paced tutorial available? Um, there is a good book. Yeah. yeah, there's a good book, yeah. Yeah. In terms of like a YouTube video, uh, we've been promising to ourselves that we'll do it uh, for a while now, but we haven't gotten to it. Um, but yeah, there's some written material out there. Yeah. This was, this was good, though, to go through this whole exercise. So. Thank you for Jonathan, do you want to show them how you, they can get your good book? Sure. Yeah, I see it now. One thing, it should actually be on the Slack channel. On the Slack channel, we have set up for this particular course. 
It's a core studio that it, uh, sorry, I was gonna demonstrate it, but it's on the Slack channel that everyone is currently signed up on. So if you have access to the Slack channel, it's right there. Otherwise, you can go to corestudio.gitbook.io slash swarm. You'll be greeted with a good book and documentation as to how to get around swarm. Yeah, and uh, on the web app as well, there's a little pink question mark uh, up by the user. Uh, you can click on that and that'll take you there. Right here. Oh, right next to the little icon, your graph tire. Think about that. There you go. Feel free to definitely frequent this and dig deep into here. If you have any questions, it does go into depth um, on other particular platforms, such as the Revit client, how the interface works, and how that gets covered. It also goes into slowly up and coming Illustrator client, random right Grasshopper client, which you shot today. Um, in terms of the dashboard, they're all very similar. They kind of all look the same and function the same. But of course, uh, once you get it into the application, it's a little bit different. As you can see here, I just imported a um, geometry. But yeah, feel free to frequent the GitHub for any future questions. And as well, it'll, it'll kind of help us understand like what other things we can build into, this, into the workshops that you'd be interested in seeing um, alongside Revit and Rhino. Also, um I would also encourage everybody that if you're on the Slack channel that after this workshop is over, still free, feel free to use that Slack channel. If you have any questions or if like you find a bug or you think of like a request or something for it, like feel free to put it on there. Like we'll, we're still engaged on it. That Slack channel is actually an over like a broad AEC tech channel. So we use it for our conference and we use it for workshops and hackathons and whatnot. Um, so it's kind of like a community. So feel free to like remain on there and keep asking questions after the fact if you can't think of anything right now. Um, okay. Feel free to add a couple more questions on the Slack. So um, I'll just consider one more question. We'll answer that. And we'll be actively answering as it goes on. Otherwise, if there's something else you'd like to talk about in a particular workshop right now, um, through the current meeting we have set up, um, go ahead and call it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Feel free to join all future workshops. Thank you, everyone. It's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See you all later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>